appropriate uh, whenever we're invoking God's special graces upon our parish, upon the whole church. Uh, we invoke the intercession of all of those who have gone before us, all those holy men and women. We use the litany also on Holy Saturday night when people are uh, brought into the church and whenever there is an ordination and, and the, the, those who are to be ordained deacons or priests or bishop always prostrate on the floor while the litany of the saints is being sung so that we might invoke all of the church, the church triumphant upon our church, the church militant still working our way there uh, to help us out because as Catholics we don't believe that death separates us. The, the distance between us and those who have gone before us is, is very permeable, you know, and so we talk to them and they pray for us. Uh, tonight, uh, my topic is, uh, is going to be our personal relationship with Jesus Christ uh, insofar as, let me get this out so I can put my little gizmo here, uh, insofar as we can use the scriptures for that purpose. And then after I'm finished, Rachel Nurse. Is Rachel here? There you are. Hi, Rachel. All right. Rachel will share with us her experience of her relationship with Jesus Christ and her story. Uh, I would also, though before I begin, like to uh, make sure that everyone is invited to the commons after the talk, after Rachel is finished, uh, social time. Uh, and Rachel will be there too if you'd like to chat with her. And last year, I promised hot chocolate and there wasn't any. <laughs> this year, there will be hot chocolate. Okay. <laughs> and coffee and lemonade. All right. And cookies, cupcakes. Uh, we have some uh, scratch cupcakes donated by them, a lot of them. So go down and eat lots of them. Uh, and some fruit for those of you who are more healthy minded. All right. That will be when Rachel is finished with her witness talk. Uh, now, Kelsey, this morning, uh, uh, not all of you, of course, were able to be there on Tuesday morning, but Kelsey Kirsting uh, shared with, uh, with those who were able to attend what is called Lexio Divina, which means divine reading. Uh, it is a way of using the scriptures in prayer. And I was not able to be there myself, but I'm told that she did a very good job of that. And so it's a sort of a how-to praying with scripture. I want to give a, a broad kind of theological approach to the use of scriptures of the Bible in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, I want to make a little connection with my introduction last night by uh, sharing with you what I just happened to think about today. Uh, something which has always profoundly affected me. Uh, now this is prior to my talking about the scriptures. It's the whole business of a personal relationship with Christ, with, co with God in Jesus Christ. Back in the 1960s, when I was in seminary, yes, 1960s, I was in seminary, uh, uh, we were all very uh, seminarians, at least the ones of us who are kind of serious about our theological studies, uh, were very much impressed with a very small book uh, uh, written by a French theologian named Jean Mouroux. And I happened about five or six years ago to think about this book again. Something made it occur to me, and I looked for it online and I could not find it. Of course, it's out of print. So I did a search through Amazon and they found me an old copy. And so I've been back through it a couple of times and it has spoken to me in a way even more strongly than it did back then. It's very thin. It's called, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's French title is Je crois en toi, I believe in thee, I believe in you. And its subtitle is The Personal Structure of Faith. And Moreau's point is, following upon Thomas Aquinas, that when we believe that something is true, our, the direction of our belief is focused first of all on the one who is saying it and not on the statement. Do you ever think of that? We had an old, remember some of you who are old enough, the act of faith. I believe all of these things revealed by God because God has revealed it. In other words, it is because so we have the creed. We think of our faith oftentimes, especially as Catholics, as the acceptance of these statements. 
That's second. It's there, all right, because we constantly profess our faith and renew our profession of faith and all the rest. But what is first is that God has revealed it and we trust in God. It's faith as trust in the person who speaks. Even on a human level, when somebody says something to you and you believe them, your husband or your wife, I mean, maybe once in a while you say prove it, but not very often, right? <laughs> you know how to accept something from a person who loves you because they said it. And you trust them and you don't ask. And that's the way the most important things in life are based on that trust and that faith. And so the personal structure of faith is really kind of an overall theological thing that we're talking about. All right. The Holy Scriptures. How is it that we can use the Scriptures in our relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm citing 105, 107, and 108 of the Catechism, if you wish. First of all, that God is the author of sacred scripture. We want to communicate with God. God is the author of sacred scripture. Now, what exactly does that mean, of course? Uh, the divinely revealed realities that are contained, contained and presented in the text of sacred scripture have been written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The church relying on the faith of the apostolic age, accepts as the sacred books of the Old and the New Testament, whole and entire with all their parts, on the grounds that, now this is important, written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church. Now, we must be careful, right? God is the author of scriptures. We are talking about God this is the paragraph 107. The inspired books teach the truth. Since therefore all that the inspired authors or sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit, we must acknowledge that the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach the truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided the sacred scripture. Do you understand that phrase? For the sake of our salvation. Whether the Red Sea really rolled back or not is not for the sake of your salvation. Do you see all of those questions that we can have about the details, historical, scientific, all the rest? That's not what the book is about. It is about the truth that we need for our salvation. That's the Catholic approach to the inspiration of scripture. And that allows me to say about some of these other things in the Bible. Sometimes they may be accurate and sometimes not as far as human history is concerned or as far as human science is concerned, which was not well developed. But as far as what we need for our salvation, yes, absolutely. This is what God wished to speak to us in the scriptures. What I often say, and I've repeated this at our Bible study Tuesday mornings oftentimes, in other words, Everything in the Bible is true, and some of it actually happened. <laughs> See, there's a difference. There's a difference in what we're talking about there. True, true in the most, um, the most profound sense of the word for our spiritual lives and our salvation. But whether or not this particular thing was a historical event, that's another issue. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And, you know, we take the guidance of the scholars and the church on that. So, nevertheless, the Catechism goes on, the Christian faith is not basically a religion of the book. There are such, such as Islam. Right. But ours is not basically a religion of the book. Christianity is the religion of the word of God, a word which is not a written mute word alone, but the word which is enfleshed and living the Word of God is Jesus Christ. If, if the scriptures aren't to be a dead letter, then Christ, the eternal Word of the living God, must, through the Holy Spirit, open our minds to understand the scriptures. So the Word of God is Jesus Christ himself, whom we relate to, and he opens our minds to understand that written Word and communicate in that way. 
Remember the story of the disciples on their way to the little town of Emmaus after the resurrection, and they were still confused. And Jesus comes and walks along with them and says, he says to them, what's your problem? What are you talking about? And they said, you don't know? Because they didn't recognize him. One of those post-resurrection stories that they didn't recognize him. You don't know what's been going on in Jerusalem? And they tell him about this Jesus we thought was going to be the Savior, and, uh, but our leaders put him to death. And now we have these women coming and telling us, some of the women among us, that, that they saw the vision of the angels and the risen from the dead, and we don't know what to think. And Jesus says to them, How slow you are to believe the scriptures. And then he began to unfold for them the scriptures, especially in the ways in which they spoke about him. The Old Testament, the prophecies, all the rest. They come to the end, and he's going to go further, and they say, wait, what are you coming with us and stay with us tonight? Stay with us, it's almost evening. Stay with us. And so he came and stayed with them. And they spent that time with them. And then, what did he do? He sat down with them and broke the bread. And in the bread, in the bread, they knew who it was. And then he passed from their sight. If we have the word and we have the broken bread, we do not have them in our sight, but we have the present. And then they said, were not all our hearts burning within us a long ago when he unfolded for us the meaning of the scriptures? So you see, what St. Luke's Gospel is telling us in that story of Jesus and uh, the, the two disciples on the way to the mass, we don't know the names, is that God himself unfolds the meaning of scripture for us. Now, that doesn't mean you're guaranteed <laughs> your interpretation. This is what I say. That would make us individual interpreters, right? And we know where all that comes from. We interpret within the context of the church itself and the church's long-standing tradition. And yet, for our own spiritual lives and our contact with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, will unfold the meaning of the scriptures to us. And if we're not certain, then of course we need some study, and we need some consultation, and we need some thought. Nevertheless, we must understand that this happens not just on the road to Emmaus 2,000 years ago, but to ourselves. And oftentimes, if you read the scriptures or you hear it in church, oftentimes, if you have your mind open and your heart open, you will hear something that you know God is speaking to you in those words. And so they turn right around and run back to Jerusalem and they say, we have seen the Lord. But the people there in the upper room say, before they do, so have we. And so we have seen the Lord when the Lord opens for us the meaning of scripture. So let's follow the logical train here. If I can go back and recap it. If God is the author of scripture, of what we need for our salvation, not of each detail in a historical or scientific way, but with what is necessary for salvation, then what the scripture contains is what God wants us to hear. And when we open our minds to the word of God in the Bible, the spirit is helping us to understand. And yes, we need study, conversation, questioning, the guidance of the church, looking things up, nevertheless. God speaks to us in that word and in those human ways. How do we connect this with our friendship with Christ, our personal relationship with Christ? Open your heart and he will speak to you in the words of scripture. Bring the person to the scripture, whether it's the mass readings or your own reading of the Bible, bring the person that you are this day. You know, people will say, especially young people get very impatient, well, it's the same thing all the time. Y yes, it is, but I'm different. You know, yes, I heard this same Sunday reading three years ago, but I'm a different person than I was three years ago. And my life is different. And God is speaking to me now in this word. We wait upon the Lord. We don't conclude necessarily any bizarre ideas about God speaking to me. You know, I have a little problem with some of that. Oh, God told me to buy a new car. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
use your own head about buying a new car. You know, well, maybe that is God telling you. You know, you can, you can interpret those things, but I think some people have the idea that God's whispering messages to them about, you know, what they should cook for dinner tonight. Uh, you, you know, God does leave us on our own, but on the other hand, we're never really on our own. You know, so there's a way of interpreting all of that to say, yes, God is guiding us and God is leading us. If we're faithful and believing, people are doing our best. All right. Now, what does that mean concretely? Well, uh, all that having been said, are there privileged parts of the Bible for this friendship with Jesus Christ? Of course, the Gospels. And within the Gospels, I mean, other parts of the Bible, sure. Uh, and, and you may find parts that are faithful. Uh, favorites, I should say. I mean, if you like Leviticus, fine, but I, you'll go to sleep. I, I guarantee you. you have trouble sleeping, you pick up the book of Leviticus. That'll be, uh, you know, still the word of God, you know. Uh, nevertheless, for us Christians, the Gospels. And within the Gospels, of course, I would say, you know, what a, a privileged place for what is called in Latin, ipsissima verba Christi, the very words of Christ. Have you ever seen a red letter edition of the Bible? They, they often make the King James Version that way, so that the words, the very words of Jesus are in red letters, so that you can, you can pick those out. Now, we know with, with uh, you know, the gospel writers and the editing that took place and all the rest, they're telling the tradition of what they have heard. There goes Asher. Uh, <laughs> they're telling the tradition of what they have heard that Jesus has said, you know, they're handing on the tradition, and they're doing it in their own way. Nevertheless, there are probably some very actual words that we have in the Gospels. This is just a little bit of an aside that I find kind of fascinating, that in all likelihood, he actually did speak. Uh, it's because they occur so often in all of the Gospels. He probably did call himself the Son of Man. He probably did have a speech pattern that was, amen, amen, I say to you. you know, it's there all of the time. How about Abba, Father? That is undoubtedly, because that's in his own language. It's in the Aramaic language Jesus spoke. And, and the little girl whom he raises from the dead, Talitha, little girl, yeah. Why is it quoted in Aramaic if it wasn't his actual words, you know? And the, the man who is uh, blind and deaf, you know, has to be open. You know, it's amazing. But, but beyond that, the words of uh, his teaching, you know, those are the words of Jesus in our Gospels, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they should have the privilege of first place in our meditation and our relating with Jesus Christ. Uh, I see at least several types of contact with Jesus in the Gospels. His conversation with others, uh, and you know, I want to leave a lot of time for Rachel here, but uh, you could go through, I've got about four different scriptures here, just to r remind you of them rather than to go through them all. Take the woman at the well. You know, this is a conversation that Jesus has, a long conversation with a woman in the Gospel of John. Take that and sort of uh, like I was doing with Zacchaeus on Sunday, imagine yourself in her place, right? And what he is saying to you. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation between him and this one person. And what does that mean? A wonderful place for relating to Jesus, our friend, in a personal relationship. Uh, or straight teaching that is not just parables. Uh, and one of the ones that I think of, and I read part of that to you, well, no, it was something similar uh, last night, the vine and the branches. You know, this is not a parable, but rather a, an extended comparison. I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me as I in you. Without me, you cannot bear much fruit at all. You know, uh, read these things where he is directly teaching us. The parables, his teaching that are even not parables, but also his actions is remember his, his miracles of healing. Um, let me think of the, the, the son of the widow of Nain. You know, he walks into this small town and there's a funeral procession coming out and they're carrying this, no doubt, an open stretcher with the body and it's a young man. It's a widow woman, this is her only son. And he realizes 
what is going on here and that this woman will have absolutely no support without her son. And so not only on a human level her missing him, but also she's left completely alone. He just stops, touches the stretcher and says, young man, get up. To meditate on something like that and on the compassion of the Lord that is embodied in a story like that. So his parables, his straightforward teaching, and his actions. And there are many other possibilities. I just say, pick up your Bible, turn to the Gospels, pause and pray. Use the techniques that, uh, uh, of uh, Lexio Divina, which is basically a slow, thoughtful, meditative reading and stop whenever something comes to you that you want to think about. It's a way of praying, a way of reading, a way of hearing the Lord in the scriptures and all of the rest of the scriptures as well. So using that word of God that we have been given in order to grow in our friendship with Jesus Christ. Most of you uh, know Rachel Nurse. If you don't know Rachel, well, that's your problem. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you know the Nurse family. And uh, Rachel uh, has been involved for how long, Rachel? But no doubt you will tell the folks about uh, Focus a little bit, right? Rachel has been involved in Focus, which is a program in which young people themselves uh, uh, minister, are, are in mission to college students in order to bring them closer to Christ. Rachel does her uh, focus work at uh, Iowa State uh, with a few others. And now up here at UNI, we also now have some focus uh, students helping out. And I believe Mary Funk is helping out in focus too, isn't she? I think. I'm not sure where she is. Is she at Iowa State? She's not, okay. But at any rate, these are young people who themselves are disciples of the Lord in a very conscious way, themselves have their own personal relationship with Jesus Christ and are called to share that with other young people. And I can tell you that their work is extremely effective. And so to help us to understand her own journey and her own relationship with Jesus Christ, Rachel Nurse. Rachel? Seven o'clock, am I accurate or what? Okay. <laughs> These can be a little difficult, but uh, okay. yeah. It yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be directly in front of your mouth, but somewhere close. That should be good. Okay, how's it? Good. Good? Good. 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 Right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Father, for the introduction. And I would just like to begin in a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, I just give you thanks and praise for the gift of this day. Thank you for everyone in the church right now. I ask that the Holy Spirit would just come and give me the words necessary. Holy Spirit, come and soften our hearts, that they would just be open to a deeper encounter with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Like Father said, my name is Rachel Nurse, and I was born and raised here in Cedar Falls, Iowa. I attended St. Patrick's Catholic School, um, K-8, through eight, and then I went to Holmes and graduated from Cedar Falls High School. From there, I went to the University of South Dakota, um, where I became a teacher, and I got a degree in special education and elementary education. I'm currently 25 years old, and like Father said, I serve as a FOCUS missionary. FOCUS stands for Fellowship of Catholic University Students. And I've been at Iowa State for the past year and a half, specifically working with women who are in sororities and introducing them to a relationship with the Lord. Um, yeah, I get to evangelize and invite students to live in a relationship with Jesus and his church. Um, it's brought me such joy um, tonight. I'll be sharing with you more about my initial encounter with Jesus in college. Um, 
yeah, South, when I was in South Dakota, that's when I radically had a transformation of heart. So I just am really excited to share with you um, about that tonight. A little closer, okay. Better? I'll speak up too. Okay. So I want to backtrack a bit um, because standing in this church it's pretty surreal because this is where my parents chose to baptize me, um, where I was catechized in the Catholic faith, um, where I received my first communion, my first reconciliation, um, and my confirmation here. Unfortunately, I didn't know the, a lot of the beauty and the meaning of the sacraments when I received them, um, but I'm really thankful to be here. Um, throughout my faith, throughout my life, um, faith was really important to me, and my parents laid an incredible foundation um, through their witness of having my brother and I go to Mass each Sunday, and how they just live a selfless life for the Lord. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't know um, how to have a daily relationship with Jesus. I knew a decent amount about him from going to Catholic school. Um, but I, I didn't know how personal that he desired to be to me. Um, so I went off to college, and I just pursued a life of living kind of however I wanted, Monday through Saturday. But as long as I checked the box of going to Mass on Sunday, I was a good person and a person living out her Catholic faith. Um, on one of these Sundays, a young woman who was doing hospitality and greeting me as I came into the church, named Brittany, um, asked me for my phone number and invited me into a Bible study. I sheepishly smiled and I gave her my number, but I had no intention of going to this Bible study. Um, it would have conflicted with my sorority socials and a party lifestyle that I was pursuing, so I didn't really have time for that. Um, but she texted me weekly, and um, in October, for some reason, I responded to one of the texts and I said that I would come. Um, the first Bible study that I went to in October of my freshman year, um, I heard this woman named Brittany speak about Jesus and her relationship with him. And I genuinely didn't know if I was at a Catholic Bible study because she talked about having a relationship with Jesus and a friendship with Jesus. And I had never heard a Catholic speak that way. And I was pretty flaky in my Bible study attendance, um, but I know that Brittany planted a lot of seeds of what it meant to have a relationship with the Lord. Um, I went the rest of my freshman year until March, kind of going to this Bible study, still going to Sunday Mass. Um, but then Brittany invited me to go on a retreat in March of my freshman year. And on this retreat, I went back to the Sacrament of Reconciliation and this is probably the first like real confession that I'd ever done, of like really being sorry for the way that I had lived and how I didn't have a daily relationship with the Lord. And I received a penance that was different than just the three Hail Marys at Or and Our Father. Um, this priest looked at me and he said, I want you for your penance to ask Jesus to tell you how much he loves you. And I was like, that is not what I grew up learning about penance. <laughs> um, but I, I did, and I went back. Um, there was adoration going on, and I just, yeah, I just sat there and cried and really let the Lord tell me how much he loved me. And that was really an instrumental moment in my life that, yeah, by the grace of God, I was able to receive this encounter and after this retreat, I knew, I knew that I had encountered God in adoration, and I knew I had encountered him in the sacrament of re reconciliation, but I didn't know like, how to live my life every day for God. After that, I knew I wanted a relationship with him. Um, I knew I experienced this like, retreat high um, of encountering Jesus, but yeah, I didn't know. What do I, I was like, what do I do after this? Um, so I started reading books just about like why stay Catholic, how to have a relationship with Jesus, reading about the lives of the saints. Um, and these were all great and they helped me learn, but I, I knew I still desired a lot more. 
So for the next year and a half, I was doing reading. Um, I went on a few other retreats and conferences. And again, I would like ride the high of those of those retreats and conferences. They would reconvict me of my need for a savior um, and really transform my view of God. But they still weren't like the everyday relationship I wanted. Um, but then the fall of my junior year. Um, I met another young woman who actually does the job that I do now through Focus. Um, her name is Kelsey, and she was from Ohio, but she was placed at the University of South Dakota. And she challenged me in ways I had never been challenged before. I told her about all the things I was involved in, all the retreats I had been on, and just how great of a Catholic I was. And. Um, <laughs> And she asked me, she's like, how's your, how's your relationship, how's your daily relationship with Jesus? And I was like, daily? Uh, I told you about these retreats and like how I've encountered the love of God. She's like, yeah, but how are you spending time with him every day? And I was like, uh, well, I'm nice to people, you know, just answers like that. And I don't think I had anyone like ask me like how my daily relationship was with Jesus was up until that point. Um, and I told her, like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to have a personal relationship with the Lord every day. Um, so this friendship with Kelsey really challenged me um, because she told me to pray 15 minutes every day uh, with Scripture. And um, I know Kelsey, Kirstine talked about Lexio Divina earlier today, and my friend Kelsey taught me how to pray with Lexio Divina. And so I started... We had a 30-day challenge that I was going to go to the chapel every day, pray for 15 minutes, and um, yeah, I was like, okay, here we go. So I started doing that, and wow, that was, that was tough, because nothing would happen. I'd sit there with the Bible open, and I started in the Gospels, and I'd read the passage three times, and I, nothing would like happen. And I'd sit there, and I'd just be angry at the Lord, like, why, am I, why is nothing happening? People keep talking about, yeah, having these crazy encounters with scripture. Nothing was happening for me. Um, shortly after this, I was in a Bible study, um, another Bible study that my friend Kelsey led. And this Bible study was focused on how to live in the world, but not of it. And the group was praying Lexia Divina um, with John 12, 43. And the verse was um, about the disciples and how they loved the glory that came from man more than the glory that came from God. And I don't know if you guys have ever had a moment where you just feel like really called out or something. Um, but I, in this moment, I just was like, that's me. That's me. I loved the glory of man and of the world more than the glory of God that I wanted to be seen as this woman who was practicing her Catholic faith and knew so much about the Lord, but was struggling to actually spend time with the Lord and get to know him personally. Yeah, this, <laughs> this verse, I really felt called out on, um, but I knew it was out of a place of charity because I, that's who Jesus is. He was, gonna call, he was calling me higher, actually, to live for the glory of God and not the glory of man. Um, and as I progressed with learning how to pray with scripture, um, it was challenging to stay committed to the word of God and pray daily. Um, but this, this routine did start to become a habit in my life. And I began to notice different things about myself as I was learning to pray with scripture that if I wasn't praying with scripture, I would seek attention from people instead of affirmation from the Lord. Um, or that when I, if I would neglect prayer, I would be more tempted to be self-seeking and yeah, just not live a life as a disciple. Um, praying with scripture, I've become so convicted, is just such a key to knowing the voice of the Lord. I've found freedom um, to just become, come before Jesus and be really honest with him because I know through the scriptures that he is going to be honest with me. Um, becoming a missionary... Um, so what I do, like, on the day-to-day -day is I get to spend time with college students and share the life of Christ with them. And the most beautiful transformations I've seen is when women and men learn how to pray, when they learn how to 
know that Jesus wants to be with them all the time and not just on a retreat, on a conference, when they come to Mass. Um, when the Word of God penetrates their hearts and they believe that Jesus' mercy and love is individual for them, is hands down one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, specifically last year, I just want to share a story about scripture and the student that I've worked with. Um, so I was leading a Bible study about um, the women in the Gospels. Um, it's been really influential for me um, to work in the sorority houses. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Gospel story of the woman who committed adultery. Uh, this woman was going to be stoned for her sins, but others knew about her. Um, so we're reading from the Gospel of John, and we read it through two different times. And a woman in the group named Jackie um, looks up, and she has kind of a high-pitched voice, and she's like, guys, guys, shut up, shut up. Like, I'm the woman, I'm the woman. Um, and we're like, what? Like, what do you mean, Jackie? And she just starts to cry, and she just tells us, like, Jesus didn't condemn her. Like, Jesus didn't condemn her, and he doesn't condemn me. And there's just this beautiful moment that Jackie realized that Jesus wasn't condemning her um, for her sinfulness, and this is because of an encounter with Jesus through the scriptures. And all I did was get to read John 7 with her about the story of the woman, and she got to put herself in that woman's shoes, and there's nothing like that. It's so beautiful. Having a relationship with Jesus and getting to teach about how to have a relationship with Jesus through the scriptures, um, sacraments, and through friendship has allowed me to know Jesus so much myself. Um, specifically, just some things I use um, to pray with. Um, the Psalms in the Old Testament uh, are just so consoling for me to know who God the Father is. And then, like Father said, the Gospels have allowed me to know Jesus himself and to just encounter his mercy. And then reading Acts of the Apostles has really called me to action to share the word of Jesus in both word and word and deed on the college campus. I think one of the, the saddest things that I hear as an on-campus missionary from college students is when they say they don't get anything out of the Mass. Um, they're like, yeah, I've gone my whole life, but I don't really get anything out of the Mass. Um, yeah, the Mass, because of having a personal relationship with Jesus, has come to fruition for me. And I get to receive him in the Eucharist, and he gets to be a complete gift of self to me. And when students start praying um, and spending time with Jesus in the scriptures, the Mass comes alive for them. I mean, the Mass is just incredible. And yeah, I think I just wanted to share that piece that it's so cool when students have a relationship with Jesus, the sacraments start to actually mean something and don't just become habits that they have to do. Um, also, just having a habit of praying with scripture um, has increased my desire to share the Lord with others. Um, I firmly believe that I can't, can't share who I don't know. Um, the same thing goes for Jesus. If I don't spend time with him, then I don't get to know him, and then I don't get to honestly share about who he is. Um, earlier, I spoke about Brittany, um, the first person who gave me an invitation uh, to a Bible study and how this was just an introductory way for me to learn about Jesus as a person. Um, so I want, yeah, just to invite you all now to reflect. Um, do you believe that you're worthy to be in a relationship with Jesus? I know I do. I didn't, but I do now. And I know that he longs to be in a relationship with you. I'd just like to close in prayer. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, I thank you. Thank you for the gift of your church. I thank you for how you long to be in a relationship with every single person on this earth. Holy Spirit, allow that, that truth to just penetrate our hearts.
Come Holy Spirit. Jesus, I thank you for who you are and how you reveal yourself to us. Mary, I thank you for your witness. I just entrust this, I entrust this parish into your hands, Mary. So we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. And Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you to Father Coulter and Susie and the retreat team uh, just for yeah, how much work and prayer that they have put into this. And thank you, St. Patrick's, for letting me speak tonight. Thank you.